And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has, God has said, He shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Sneaky, subtle. It's a nice story, eh? The first thing is, the for instant, the instant implication is, well, you can't trust God. So that's pretty sneaky. And the next is, well, he's trying to, he's trying to pull a fast one on you. And the next one is, well, he's trying to do that because he's jealous, and he, he doesn't want you to know things that he knows, because that wouldn't be so good. And he's lying to you anyways, because you're not going to die. And if you eat it, contrary to what you've been informed, then all that's going to happen is your eyes will be open and you'll be like gods, knowing good and evil. Well, that sounds pretty damn good. So, you know, and I, I mean, Eve, what does she know? You know, it's no wonder she's susceptible to such blandishments. And it's quite interesting, too, because Adam and Eve, God tells Adam and Eve not to eat the damn fruit, but they never promise not to, right? So... They haven't promised, they've just been told to. And well, should they be obedient? Well, how obedient do you want your children to be? You want them to be obedient enough so they don't get hurt, but disobedient enough so that they go out in the world and do something courageous and they break some rules and they learn some things. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a very paradoxical story. Anyways, the serpent wins, wins this round, man. And so Eve pays attention to the snake. So again, we have the same set of images, right? We have Adam and we have Eve. We have this tree and we have this strange serpent. That's a dragon-like form. There is a sphinx-like form that's associated with the tree. The snake's eternally associated with the tree. Well, the snake was eternally associated with the tree. We spent, God only knows how many tens of millions of years as tree-dwelling primates. And the primary or one of our primary predators, we had three primary predators, snakes. Birds, cats. And so the snake has been associated with the tree for a very, very long time. And the lesson the snake tells people is, you bloody well better wake up or something you don't like will get you. And who's going to be more susceptible, most susceptible to paying attention to the snake? And that's going to be Eve. And the reason for that is Eve has offspring. And there's nothing tastier to a snake than a child. And so Eve had every reason to be self-conscious and neurotic and women are more self-conscious and neurotic than men by quite a substantial amount. And that's true cross-culturally. And it emerges at puberty. And part of the reason is, as far as we can tell, is that women are more sexually vulnerable. They're also smaller. So that's a problem if you're engaged in any physical alteration. But most importantly, I think, is that why would you ever assume that a human female's nervous system is adapted to her or her well-being? Why wouldn't you assume instead that her nervous system is adapted to the female infant dyad? Because if it isn't, then the infants die. And so you might think, well, women are way more susceptible to depression and anxiety than men are. And that's a hell of a burden to bear. And that's also true cross-culturally, by the way. And it also kicks in at puberty. And the biggest differences are in Scandinavia, for those of you who think it's sociocultural, which it isn't. So... But there's reasons for it, you know, and it's also at puberty when men and, men and women start to become sexually dimorphic in terms of size, and men are way more powerful in their upper bodies. It's in, incomparably more powerful, and so that makes them a lot more dangerous. And human, the human primary human defense mechanism is punching, like with kangaroos, for, because kangaroos, there's some other animals that punch. Chimps can punch too, but human beings, it's a punch, and most of the force in that is upper body and shoulder. And so a woman's no match for a man in a fight. So she has every reason to be nervous, especially when you add that to that her additional sexual vulnerability and the fact that she has to take care of extraordinarily dependent infants who are extremely fragile for a very long period of time. And so she had every... And women are more self-conscious than men. The empirical literature on that is clear. It's associated with trait neuroticism because self-consciousness is actually an unpleasant emotion. Who wants to be self-conscious? If I'm self-conscious on the stage talking to you, then all of a sudden I can't even talk to you. All I'm doing is thinking about me and all the things that are wrong with me, and I fall inside myself. It's like self-consciousness, although it's a great gift, let's say, is nothing pleasant. It's associated primarily with anxiety. So Eve had every reason to pay attention to the snake, that's for sure. I think I read this week that among, I can't remember which tribesmen it, where it was, unfortunately, although I did put a footnote in my new book about this, um, these, these were jungle-dwelling tribal people. 
5% of the adults had been attacked by a python and a substantial number of children had been killed by them so snake predation was no joke it shaped our evolutionary past and still is no joke in many places and so we're attuned to snakes and the thing is, as Lynn Hesbell pointed out, an anthropologist we are really good at detecting the camouflage patterns of snakes, especially in the lower half of our visual field and there's evidence that part of the reason that human beings have such acute vision which means that our eyes opened, let's say is because we were we co-evolved with snakes and we learned how to see them and then the price we paid for seeing was that our brain grew because you need a lot of brain to be able to see and the consequence of our brain growing is one day we woke up and discovered the future and the future is where all the snakes might live instead of where they live right now so there's that the same thing and the same so interesting again these images you see in this one you have the specter of death in the tree with the snake and the fruit. Now fruit is interesting too. I already made the case that there's a tight linkage between what you eat and information, right? A conceptual link as well as a practical link. But it's also the case that we can see colors. And the question is why? And the answer is because we evolved to see ripe fruit. So in the story of Adam and Eve, human beings are given vision by the snake and the fruit. And that turns out to be correct. So isn't that something? And then you think, what role do women play in relationship to men? Well, first, they make themselves conscious. Let's not ever forget about that. Because the, I would say the primary role that women have in relationship to men is to make themselves conscious. And men don't precisely like that. There's nothing that will make a man more self-conscious than being rejected. And why, because why is he rejected? Well, obviously, Mother Nature, in the guise of that particular woman, has said, you're not so bad for a friend, but there's no reason that your genetic material should propagate itself into the future. <laughs> <clears throat> right, well, and it's not like men are exactly happy about being made, by, made self-conscious by women. Right, it's a major source of continual tension between men and women, and it's no wonder. But it's also the case, and this is something really cool and interesting to know. You know, we div 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 divulged... Div divulged? Di Whatever. That's it, diverged. We diverged from the common ancestor between us and chimpanzees about six million years ago. Here's why, at least in part. Chimpanzee females are non-discriminant maters. They'll mate with any male. When they go into heat, which human females don't, when, when they go into heat, then any male is allowed access. Now the dominant males chase the subordinate males away. And so the dominant males are more likely to leave offspring, but it's not because of the female choice. It's not the case with human beings. Human females engage in hypergamy, and hypergamy is the... T and this is also true cross-culturally, and it's also quite... Uh, it's just as extensive in Scandinavia. Not quite. There's a bit of attenuation, but not much. Women mate across and up dominance hierarchies. Men mate across and down. Okay, and that has to be the case, because <laughs> obviously it has to work that way. If one goes up, the other has to go down. The socioeconomic status of a woman is almost determines almost zero of her attractiveness towards a man. Whereas the socioeconomic status of a man is a major determinant of his attractiveness towards a woman. And it isn't his wealth either, because that's been tested. It's his capacity to generate and be productive and to share, because that beats the hell out of wealth. Wealth can disappear, right? But the capacity to be productive and share, that's, that's a much more important element. And why not be chosen on the basis of that, especially because women have to have infants, and infants make the woman dependent, and the woman is just looking logically, rationally, and from an evolutionary perspective, for someone who's useful enough to, give a, to lend a hand. So, women make intense demands on men, and it's no wonder. But the thing is, is that because women engaged in hypergamy, at least in part, we diverged quite rapidly from chimpanzees because the selection pressure that women placed on men developed the entire species. Now, there's two things that happened as far as I could tell. The men competed for competence, let's say. So the male hierarchy is a mechanism that pushes the best men to the top, virtually by definition. And then that's, that's, the effect of that is multiplied by the fact that women who are hypergamous peel from the top. And so that the males who are the most competent are much more likely to leave offspring and that seemed to be what drove our cortical expansion for example which happened very very rapidly over the course of evolutionary time so and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise 
She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Oh yes, and women share food. That's a very strange thing because most creatures don't do that, right? Most animals don't share food. Like if, you, if you're a wolf and you bring down a, something in a hunt, you eat your fill. The dominant ma- creatures eat their fill and then if there's some left over, the subordinates get to eat too. But that isn't how human beings work. We share food. Now you can imagine how that evolved. Because lots of female creatures share food with their offspring. Okay, you don't need much of a twist in that from an evolutionary perspective t- till you start to share food not only with your offspring, say, but with your mate. And that's another way that you entice a mate. It's like, we're going to be better together than alone. Well, that's the offering of the fruit. Well, what's the self-conscious part? Well, here's part of the bargain, you know. I'm going to wake you up. And partly I'm going to wake you up because you need to be woken up because I have this infant that needs some damn care. And so you bloody well better be awake. And part of the bargain is I'll offer you something. I'll offer you some food. And in response, we're going to make a team. And that's the deal. Well, that's the human deal. And that's why we're more or less monogamous by why we more or less pair bond and why something approximating marriage is a human universal. It's cross-cultural. Now, you can find exceptions, but who the hell cares? The vast... Really, man, who cares? You look at the vast pattern. The vast pattern. Well, and the price we pay for having large brains is that we're very dependent and it takes a long time for us to get programmed. And because of that, we need relatively stable family bonding. And that's basically what we've evolved. And you know, you don't get that without making men self-conscious because male creatures, why not impregnate and run? I mean, why the hell not? And that's something to really, no kidding. Like, that's the thing to think about. It is not why men abandon their children. That's the mystery. It's why any men ever stick with them. That's the mystery. Because you just have to look at the animal kingdom. And like the simplest and easiest thing is always the most likely thing to occur. So... It's the exception, the long-term commitment that needs explanation. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, implying that before that they were closed. And they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So that's so interesting. So their eyes are open, which indicates that they weren't to begin with. So whatever God created to begin with was kind of blind. But not Blind in some strange way, because they weren't obviously wandering around in the garden, bumping into trees. It was some sort of metaphysical blindness that's been removed by whatever has just happened. And whatever's just happened also made them realize that they were naked. Okay, so what sort of eye-opening is that? Well, what does it mean to realize that you're naked? It means to realize that you're vulnerable. That's what people discovered. It's like, oh, oh, we can be hurt. So you're a zebra in a herd of zebras, and there's a bunch of lions around there, laying on the grass. You don't care. Those are laying down lions. Laying down lions are no problem. It's standing up hunting lions that are the problem. You're not smart enough to figure out that laying down lions turn into standing up hunting lions, so you're not like building a fort to keep the lions out. You're just mindlessly eating grass. You're not very awake, but that's not what happens to human beings, is they wake up and they think, we're vulnerable, permanently. It's never going away, right? It's the, it's the recognition of that internal vulnerability. And what happens? The first thing they do is clothe themselves. Well, what happens when you're naked, when you need protection from the world? Well, obviously, look, you're all wearing clothes, you know? Why? Well, we've been doing that for a very, very long period of time. It's tens of thousands of years at minimum. In fact, you can track more or less when clothing developed because you can do DNA testing of the kind of lice that cling to clothes rather than hair. And so we have a pretty good idea of when clothing emerged and of different types as well. So that's quite cool. But the point is, they're naked and they think, that's not so good. We're vulnerable. So their eyes were open enough so they become self-conscious and they recognize their own vulnerability. And the first thing they do is the first step of culture is to protect themselves with something from the world. And you protect yourself from the world and from the prying eyes of other people. This is the book by Lynn Isbell, Why We See So Well. From the temptation of Eve to the venomous murder of the mighty Thor, the serpent appears throughout time and culture as a figure of mischief and misery. The worldwide prominence of snakes in religion, myth, and folklore underscores our deep connection to the serpent. But why, when so few of us have first-hand experience? The surprising answer this book suggests lies in the singular effect of snakes on primate evolution. Predation pressure from snakes, Lynn Isbell tells us, is ultimately responsible for the superior vision and large brains of primates and for a critical aspect of human evolution. That was tested recently. 
Psychologists have known for a long time that people are, can learn fear to snakes, but they discovered in primates recently a set of neurons, pulvinar neurons, which are specialized, that's in old, old perceptual systems, reveal neurobiological evidence of past selection for rapid detections of snakes. So that's from 2013. So the snake definitely woke us up. Color vision as an adaptation to fruit eating in primates. It's not by accident that women make themselves look like ripe fruit in order to be attractive to men. Right? And that's also not socio-cultural in origin. So... And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. That's interesting. So what's the implication? Prior to being woken up, prior to recognizing nakedness and vulnerability, there was no reason for God, for man and woman to hide from God. Now are they hiding from God? Well, they're naked. They're vulnerable. Okay, so think about this. Think about this. It's like... Imagine that you have the capacity to live truthfully and courageously and forthrightly. Just imagine that. And then imagine why you might not do that. And then imagine, well, how about fear and shame? How, how would that work? Well, let's say that the idea of living forthrightly and truthfully and courageously is analogous, given what we already know about these stories, to walking with God in the garden. Well, what stops people from doing that? What stops people from hiding? Well, it's their own, it's a recognition of their own inadequacy. They look at themselves and they think, how in the world is a creature such as I supposed to live properly in this world with everything that's wrong with me? And so what do you hide from? Well, you, you go home, you sit on your bed for five minutes and ask yourself, what have you hidden from in your life? Man, you'll have books of knowledge reveal themselves to you in your imagination, right? You say, well, why are you hiding? Well, it's no bloody wonder you're hiding. It's no wonder that people hide. That's the thing that's so terrifying about this story. We woke up and we thought, oh my God, look at this place. Like, this is seriously, there's some serious trouble here and we're in some serious trouble and we're not what we could be. And so we hide. And that's what the story says. People woke up, they became self-conscious. They recognized their own vulnerability and that made them, made them hide from manifesting their divine destiny. It's like, yeah, that's exactly right. And the Lord God, I love this part of the story. And that's so funny. And the Lord God called, and we could use a little humor at this point. <laughs> and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I, af I was afraid because I was naked. So in case there was any doubt about that, that's why. And I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And this is where Adam shows himself in all his post-fall heroic glory. And the man said, the woman! <laughs> Whom thou gavest to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. So that's such, per, man, that's such, that, it's so, you know, again, there's a modern feminist interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve that makes the claim that Eve was portrayed as the universal bad guy of humanity for disobeying God and eating the apple. It's like, fair enough, you know. Looks like she slipped up. And then she tempted her husband and, you know, that makes her even worse, although he's was foolish enough to immediately eat, so it just means she was a little more courageous than him than got there first. But it's Adam who comes across as really one sad creature in this story, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Look at what he manages in one sentence. It's like, first of all, it wasn't him, it was the woman. And second, he even blames God. It's like, <laughs> it wasn't just the woman, it was, it was that woman, and you gave her to me. <laughs> and she gave me of the tree and I did eat. It's like, so, hey, Adam's all innocent, except now he's... Not only is he naked and disobedient and cowardly and ashamed, he's also snivelly, backbiting <laughs> fink. He rats her out like the second he gets the opportunity and then he blames God. It's like, and that's exactly right. That's exactly right, man. You go online and you read, you read the commentary that men write about women when they're resentful and bitter about women. 
You read it, it's so interesting. It's like, it's not me, it's those bitches. Okay, <laughs> that's right, it's not me, it's them. And not only that, what a bloody world this is in which they exist. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And it is absolutely pathetic. All right.